Let me echo those words of uh, welcome to everyone who's here today, especially our guests. If you do have one of those packets, you found a tiny card in there, attendance card. Would you please pass those attendance card to the middle aisle be picked up at this time. We are almost halfway through this current sermon series. The series is simply this. We're looking at the questions that Jesus asked. Did you know that during his ministry, he asked over 300 questions? Sometimes he asked questions to make a point. Sometimes he asked questions to point out false doctrine. Sometimes he asked questions to, to reveal needs in a person's life. Sometimes he asks questions to advance the gospel. Today we're looking at a very, very difficult question for us today. Because remember, these questions, the primary audience were the people around Jesus at that time. But we are the secondary audience. And these questions come to us today. The question is, as Tim read it, do you suppose... Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I want to focus on the first three words. Do you suppose? Because the message to these people in Luke 13 is a message that you and I, that you and I need today. Do you suppose? Do you suppose? On January the 28th, 1986, six ex astronauts climbed aboard Challenger. Five were NASA astronauts, and one was a civilian, a female, a elementary teacher. Moments into that flight, Challenger exploded. Do you suppose, do you suppose that this six group, that six astronauts were worse people than all the other astronauts? Do you suppose that God was maybe punishing them for being bad people? I think you'll understand that question as we get into the lesson this morning. But one more example. December 21st, 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 is flying over Lockerbie, Scotland. Suddenly, a package down in cargo explodes, making the whole plane explode. Body parts, along with parts of the airplane, is scattered all over the city of Lockerbie, Scotland. Do you suppose? Do you suppose that the people on that flight were being punished by God for being bad people? Furthermore, the singing group, The Temptations, you might remember them from the 60s and, and early 70s. They were supposed to be on that flight, and at the very last moment, they canceled it to hold over and do one more show, one more performance in Europe. Were they spared because they were better people than the other singing groups around at that time? Or let's make it personal. Let's go back to 2002. I had a couple in counseling trying to save their marriage. The husband, who had been unfaithful to his wife, the husband had contracted HIV. We were worried about the wife. Would she have HIV also? She was spared. She didn't have it. Is that because she was a better person than the other wives married to men who have HIV? Or let's look at the book of Job. 
if you want to have questions about the issue of suffering, look at the book of Job. In the book of Job, and he lived about the same time we believe as Abraham. So he's living somewhere between Genesis 12 and Genesis 25. He tackles the issue of suffering because suffering came his way. And then finally, this morning, Jesus, he broaches the subject twice here in Luke chapter 13. We got some points that we're going to make from this lesson. Point number one, you can't judge sinners by their suffering. Let's go back to Luke chapter 13. Let's actually begin in verse 1. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans. Now, who were the Galileans? If you look at the promised land of the Old Testament, by the time the New Testament rolls around, the promised land is now divided into the southern part called Judea, the middle part called Samaria, and then the very top part, the north part, was Galilee. And the people of Judea, they looked down on the Galileans. Here we have Jesus. We think Jesus is probably somewhere in Judea when this question comes up. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. The historian Josephus and the historian Philo both write about this occasion. We have a large group of Galileans who go down to Jerusalem to worship God. Unfortunately for them, Pilate had heard the rumor that they were going to be revolting, that there was going to be a rebellion come from this group of people. So what did he do? He sent in his soldiers. And they surrounded these Galileans. And those Galileans had no hope. They were all butchered. They said that the blood of the worshipers flowed with the blood of the sacrifices. This was a horrible thing that happened. The question is, were these Galileans bad people? At first glance, it appears that the people reporting to are reporting to evoke Jesus condemnation of Pilate. Hey, we want Jesus to uh, to uh, to condemn Pilate. We want him to say something bad about Pilate. But what is Jesus' response? His response highlights a side issue for them and for us today. Crowd of Luke 13 the crowd of Luke 13 probably had a very low opinion of the Galileans. Remember John chapter 1, Philip and Nathaniel. Philip tells Nathaniel about meeting Jesus, and Nathaniel asks the question, well, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's an old Galilean city. You know those people up there? They're unlearned. They're not cultured. They're not like us. They're different from us. Could we, could we be like that? Could we today have prejudice in our hearts? My father, my father, he had nothing good to say about Yankees. Billy, not the team, people, okay, not the team. Well, actually, he probably didn't say a whole lot good about the team either because he was a Cardinal fan. But he didn't like Yankees. It didn't help that the only thing we had stolen off the farm was stolen by a Yankee, okay, from a person from north. But he was prejudiced against Yankees. Could we be prejudiced? Could we look at our five and say, well, I know they're going to go to hell, I know they don't have any hope of heaven, but guess what? I don't really want to put forth the effort to save them because they're just not that important. 
to me. Can we have a wrong viewpoint of people? Jesus replied, people who suffer more than others are not necessarily greater sinners. If you were to equate suffering as a direct connection to being good or bad, guess what? Jesus would be the worst sinner of all because he suffered the most. No. Things happen. Things happen to us. Jesus is warning us here not to speculate about others, but instead inspect. Inspect our own lives. How close am I living to the gospel? Before I try to get that speck out of that other guy's eye, I better be careful about that beam that's in my eye. Am I living the way God would want me to? And then Jesus gives us a second illustration. Let's read on. Verse number four. Or those 18 on whom the tire uh, in Siloam, this is in Judea. Let's forget about the Galileans. Let's talk about you good Judeans. Let's talk about people that you know, people that you love people that you care about. It fell and killed them. All indication says that this is what an accident. These victims were not Galileans. These were probably Judeans. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You will all likewise perish. He says the same thing in verse 5 as he said in verse 3. Go back to verse 4. The Greek word that usually is translated in English as sinners can often be rendered as culprits or debtors. How do you view those people? What's your viewpoint on them? Because see, Jesus repeats what he said in verse 3 about the Galileans. He says the same thing about these Judeans. Point number two, a sinful world will suffer. Jesus gives back to them two questions. Verse 2, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners? Verse 4, you think that these Judeans were worse sinners? Guess what, folks? Death. Death is the consequence of sin in our world. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, that's a reflection upon what just was written. Jesus is our hope. We have faith in times of, tr of trouble. Verses five, uh, verse one through verse five of chapter five. Christ, Christ took our place. Verses six through verse 11. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, that would be Adam, Genesis 2. And death through sin. How did death enter? It was through sin, through our disobedience, through mankind's disobedience to God. And thus death spread to all men because all have sin. Chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but to God is eternal life in Christ our Lord. We do not live in a perfect world. Our world was perfect, and then sin contaminated our world. And we live now in a sinful world. Here's Jesus' point. The depths of these people did not prove that they were greater sinners because all mankind who reaches the age of accountability, who knows right from wrong, have sin. You have sinned. I have sinned. We need a Savior. So why do bad things happen to good people? 
it's because we live in a sinful world. Now here's the test. And don't miss the test. The test is whether we will stay faithful despite the bad that happens around us and to us. Will we stay faithful? Job, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, God gave Satan the opportunity. If you want to prove to me that Job only worships me because of what I've done for him, chapter 1, you can take everything away. And Satan does take everything away, and Job still stays faithful. Chapter 2, the devil says, well, it's only because he's in good health and hasn't happened, hasn't really affected him directly. It's indirectly around him. If you were to take away what he has health-wise, he's going to curse you. Satan takes away his good health. Job still stays faithful. Will we be faithful despite what may happen to us? Will we be found faithful? Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Point number three, self-righteous people judge those who suffer. Remember how the Judeans looked down on the Galileans? Do we ever do that? Have we ever done that? I mentioned Job. Job's friends did not understand. They did not understand that no one has the right to stand in judgment against people who suffer. You just don't have that right at all. His friend, his friend here in Job chapter 22, notice what he says, verse 4. It is because of your fear of him that he corrects you. God is just correcting you because... Well, you need to be corrected. And enter into judgment with you. Is not your wickedness great? And your iniquity, your iniquity without end? Other words, they had the same, he had the same idea, the same outlook as the disciples. John chapter 9, let's start in verse 1. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Blind from birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? Surely someone sinned here because look at what suffering this man is going through. Was it this man who sinned or the parents that he was born blind what was Jesus' answer? Neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Jesus does a mighty miracle. But let's bring it on home. Could I, could I have a legalistic attitude? Could I be hypocritical of people? Could I look down on folks? In 1940, Robin, Robin did something that she should not have done. She got pregnant as a single young lady. The father, the father was an Asian American. His parents had come from Japan to this country. 1940. Remember what happened in the 1940s, a little bit later? War, War II, Pearl Harbor. Suddenly, Asian Americans, they're looked down upon by us Americans, us good Americans. Robin could have, she could have done what other girls would do. She could have had an abortion. Or she could have just given up the baby in adoption, but she knew in her heart that no one would love that baby more than she would love that baby. That baby was born, and that baby, you know, sometimes children look just like one or both parents. Well, this baby looked just like his dad. And then, as I said, Pearl Harbor. No one wanted to hire Robin in the small little town that she lived in. She kept on getting fired. Why? 
because she was the mother of that baby. That baby. Finally, she moved to Nashville. And luckily for her, she started working for a Christian family in Nashville. They would eventually convert her to the Lord. She became a Christian. She was so supportive of her son. Her son went to college and then went into officer training school and became a second lieutenant in the military. He would rise up to finally, when he left the military after 25 years, he left it as a colonel in the military. But go back to when he was a captain, a captain in Vietnam, in the war in Vietnam. He, his actions, his decision, his effort saved 41 people that day in the battle. He was given numerous awards for that. But uh, by, by the way, I need to tell you this. Of those 41 people he saved, one was the grandson of the first person who fired his mom for having a baby like that. What if Robin's baby had never grown up? What if Robin's baby had been aborted? Would that grandson would have died in that battle? Is it easy to be legalistic? Yes. We can look at ourselves and say, well, I'm such a good person. I'm such a good person. You know, those other people, they're the ones that need forgiveness. Those other people, they're the ones who need to ask God for forgiveness. God, forgiveness starts right here with me. I don't want to be legalistic. I don't want to look down on people. I want to see people the way my Lord sees people, with love. Genuine punishment for sin is reserved for the next world, for eternity, not this one. Do you suppose our world could be a better place if we looked at people with love instead of being so critical of them? Do you think this place of ours do you suppose it could be a more family-friendly place if we were not so, so opinionated about things that the Bible doesn't even talk about? Point number four, suffering should make us repent. Jesus said repent, Luke 3. Jesus said repent, Luke 5. What is repent? What does that mean? The literal meaning is to change one's mind. You're going in this direction and you go the opposite direction. You're going in the direction of Satan, now you're going in the direction of God. Repent. And what is the other word that we usually associate repent with? Confess sins. The literal meaning of that is to say the same thing. What, I, what does that mean? We say the same thing about sin that God says. Sin is wrong. There's no excuse. No passing the buck. It's me. True repentance. What's true repentance? True repentance, write this down. True repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that proves itself in a change of life, change of mind, a change of heart, a change life. So what? You know, I love to end my lessons with that question, so what? If questions were good for Jesus, they're good for me too. So, so what? Practical applications for living today. What do I need to repent have I said things that were hurtful? Have I said things that were critical? Have I, have I looked down on people around me? Have I said things that I should never have said? Do I get myself involved in things? TV, movies, 
that maybe a Christian shouldn't be involved in in watching? What about my hidden sins that you don't know about, but I know about, and God knows about? What needs to be removed? One of the things I've always found interesting, because we have some history books written by Christians from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries. Now keep in mind, history books can be right, they can be wrong, but I have no reason to, uh, to doubt this part. The history books written by Christians about the church from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries often talk about how the Christians would come together in prayer, in prayer for one another, because guess what? I'm struggling. Peter struggled with prejudice. Remember, book of Galatians. Paul had to help him to realize it. Have I struggled in some ways? What needs to be removed from my life? If Jesus was to come and visit me, would he have a laundry list of things that, hey, Michael, here's what you need to work on. Here's what you need to do. Jesus did that actually for seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. He gave them a laundry list of things they needed to change in their lives. What do I need to change? What do I need to do? What of the... uh, What of the... um, most influential on my life, one of the elders that influenced me more than probably any other elder, in his prayers, and I heard him pray so many times, he would say, God, forgive me first because I need to be forgiven because I know there's things in my life this past week that I, well, I didn't do right. I know that you would be disappointed in me. So before I pray for all these other people, I want you to forgive me. Then I want to ask for their forgiveness because he would say, I know that they've also done things wrong. Has your anger ever come out? Maybe this past week. Has your temper flared up? Have you, have you not shown love to the people around you? What needs to be removed? Do you suppose, one more question, do you suppose that Jesus would say to you and to me, I got something against you. Here's where we need to talk. Do you suppose? If you're not a Christian this morning, we're going to have two elders up here waiting for you. Do you believe? Will you repent? Will you confess? Confess Jesus. This is confessing Jesus as the true Son of God. And will you be baptized? Most of us here are Christians. As a Christian, you need to seek forgiveness. The church here stands ready to pray with you and for you. Do you suppose that this is the morning that you need to make things right? Will you please come as we stand and sing for your encouragement? Let the cross Christ will meet you.